Hi guys, welcome to another lesson. So, as ever, if you do the do now questions, please, um, you'll see them here. Do them in your workbook. I'll give you a minute to go through them. The first do now question is, what was the name of the Greek philosopher who first described the atom? What was the name of the Greek philosopher who first described the atom? What dessert did John Dalton use to help describe atoms? So what dessert did he use to describe atoms? And number three, who proposed the nucleus has neutrons in it? Who proposed the nucleus has neutrons in it? I'll give you a second to write the answers for that. And we'll go over the answers just now. So the name of the Greek philosopher who first described the atom was Democritus or Democritus. And that was in 400 BC, so over 2000 years ago. What dessert did John Dalton use to help describe atoms? Well, he used this kind of plum pudding model where he thought that an atom was kind of like a big mass of positive energy. And in between that was little electrons or negatively charged particles, kind of like the plums in a plum pudding. And number three, who proposed the nucleus has neutrons in it? That was Sir James Chadwick. So in the last lesson, we looked at the history of the atom and how our view has changed. And I thought it'd be interesting to talk about something that we're going to talk about in more detail in your living as well. But it kind of fits into the advent of chem chemistry. So how did modern chemistry come around? And how did the theory change over time? So what we're talking about today is something called phlogiston. Now, phlogiston was believed to be a substance found in materials that burned and when the material burned it was actually this material this substance called phlogiston that was burning and when a material had used all its phlogiston up then it would stop burning and the fire would go out so phlogiston is was a theory that was held for a number of years and it actually was quite difficult to convince people that that wasn't what was going on and what i want to do is look through the evidence and how that theory changed over time um, and it's kind of related to the conservation of mass as well, you'll see. So there's a lot of uh, words in writing, but I'm going to read it all out. And you'll just have a few questions in your workbook that I'd like you to answer as we go along. So don't feel like you have to write all of this down, but just pay attention to me and hopefully this makes sense. So before the 1660s, which wasn't that long ago, chemistry textbooks still kind of looked like spell books. At the time, the practice of chemistry was still very much rooted in alchemy, a rich mixture of science, occultism and superstition. So if you think about modern chemistry where we are maybe putting things together, different chemicals to see the reaction and what they create, if you think back to kind of medieval times before the scientific revolution, people who would mix things together to create new substances were called alchemists. And it was very different from what we have today, but similar sort of principle in terms of adding random things together and seeing what you get. So alchemy was steeped in superstition um, and had sort of almost like a mythical standing, almost religious, uh, whereas obviously modern chemistry is very um, secular. It's scientific, it's not the myths and beliefs and stuff that were surrounding alchemy do not apply to modern chemistry. But without alchemy, it's unlikely that we would have modern chemistry the way we have it today. So, like we always see in science, there's a progression of thought as humans gained more information based on trial and error and evidence, then our understanding of the world increases, but we also change our theories over time. And one of those theories that changed significantly was this theory of phlogiston. So, how did it come around? Well, there was a German alchemist named Johann Joachim Becker, and he outlined the theory of fundamentally flammable elements called terra pinguis. Substances that burned easily in air, like oils, waxes and metals, were rich in terra pinguis, which we called phlogiston, or was called phlogiston. This guy here, I think, looks <laughs> really like Bob Ross, who's an amazing painter. <coughs> Check him out on YouTube. Um, but, yeah. Becker basically came up with this idea that phlogiston was the cause of all uh, the flammable materials. 
if you look back to books that were written at the time by our man, um, you wouldn't expect this in a chemistry book. You can see there's a lot of symbols there um, on the front of this this textbook. Um, it looks very different to what a chemistry textbook would look like now. So it was still steeped very much in the sort of mysticism of alchemy. Um, but it was important nonetheless. I'm um, trying to figure out why do things burn? What? Why do some things burn and others don't? So Becker's theory was taken up and refined by Georg Ernst Stahl, who renames Terapingus to phlogiston, which is Greek from burning up. So Stahl really cemented the idea that phlogiston was a thing. Um, what Becker and Stahl observed was that many objects burned readily in air. The substances left behind by the burning were not flammable themselves. Ash left over from a campfire, for example, cannot be reignited. When metal burns, a solid and sometimes brightly coloured substance is left behind with completely different properties than the original metal. At the time, the leftover substance was called a calx. So anything that was left over after all the material had been burned, they called calx. And the, the campfire example is really a nice example to look at because we're all fairly familiar with that. I have a wood burning house and it fills up with ash quite quickly and that releases a lot of smoke, unfortunately, but the wood burner is fantastic, keeping you warm. Um, so if you build a campfire like this one, you start with a big pile of logs. As the fire burns, the pile of logs sh slowly shrinks. By the end of the evening, all that's left is a small pile of ash. What happened to the matter that you started with and was it all just destroyed by the fire? Now, had I not spoken to you guys about the conservation of mass and how chemical reactions work, if I asked you to explain that, then it might be really difficult. In fact, I would guarantee that I wouldn't be able to come up with a very good explanation about what happened to all the wood. I'd say, yeah, it's just been destroyed by the fire. But we know from the law of conservation of mass that nothing is ever you know, created or destroyed. It just changes form. So the wood has changed form. It doesn't look like wood anymore. And there's been a chemical reaction and something else has happened. So this is their way of trying to explain what that is. And um, what you'll see the word calx, I use that quite a lot as we move forward. If you have your wood and you burn it all evening, you let the fire burn out entirely. You're left with this ash and the ash is what's left after everything's burnt away. They called this material calx, C-A-L-X. So calx was the name they used for any material that was left over from something being burned. So this was their theory, okay? Say that they set fire to some metal <coughs> and the metal was full of this substance that they called phlogiston. Then the phlogiston would rise up into the air. The air would become full of phlogiston and when the material had run out of phlogiston, it left calx behind, which means no more phlogiston can be released. And that was basically trying to explain why things burned and what happened to the, the elements when they burned. So the phlogiston was kind of taken off into the air. And this air above an area that would be set on fire would be described as phlogisticated air. So <clears throat> looking at our campfire example again, would make sense just looking at it, okay, if you didn't really know much about chemistry. We have our wood, we set it on fire. If the fire wood is full of this phlogiston, as we burn the wood, the phlogiston has been released and all that is left is this calx. We can't burn that again because all the phlogiston has been used up. So if you if you sell it like that, it's quite logical. <clears throat> we now know it's completely untrue, but you can understand why people would believe that at the time. It kind of makes sense. Um, when you think about it like that. So this is what they believed in phlogiston, okay? The, these observations form the basis of phlogiston theory. Flammable materials and metals are said to be rich in phlogiston, a fundamental element that conferred the properties of fire onto a substance. When a phlogisticated substance is burned in ordinary air, the phlogiston gets released and absorbed by the surrounding air, leaving behind ash or calx that has spent all of its phlogiston and can cannot therefore be reignited. The theory explains that closed contained observation by postulating that the air can only absorb so much phlogiston, at which point it is fully phlogisticated and cannot support 
any more combustion. So the air becomes so full of this substance called phlogiston, it can't take any more. And that's what burns covers the fire. Now, have you ever looked at a fire? So I talked about my wood burner. When I use my wood burner, I've got some uh, slats that I can open that increase the amount of oxygen that goes in. And when I close those slats, the oxygen dies very quickly. And we looked in the experiment, I think this year, last year, we did the candle experiment. I apologise if we haven't, it might have been year 11, but we can do that hopefully when we get back into school. But if you had a candle and you put a beaker or a cup over the candle, the candle goes out very, very quickly because what's actually happening is the fire needs oxygen to burn. But if you didn't know what oxygen was, oxygen hadn't been discovered at this point, you might think that all the air in that cup is becoming phlogisticated and therefore that's why it runs out because the air cannot take any more phlogiston into it. So they were in the right ballpark area, like it wasn't completely nonsensical. They couldn't prove any of this, they didn't know what oxygen was. Um, what was actually happening was the reverse. You were, you were actually running out of oxygen and that was killing the flame because the fire needed oxygen to burn. So they were in the right ballpark figure but they just had the wrong sort of theory about it. So one of the main issues they had with the phlogiston theory was that, um, and it became the dominant theory at the time, was phlogiston was associated with the matter of heat and light. A physical substance that was transferred whenever and wherever heat or light was transferred. So the phlogiston was transferred wherever there was a fire. However, there was a small problem. Nobody could agree on whether the phlogiston, so this mythical substance, had any mass. Did it have any weight? Some measurements showed that phlogiston to have mass and others showed that it had no mass or even a negative mass. So what, that doesn't even make any sense. How could something have a negative mass? So if I'm holding um, a cup, okay, the cup has to weigh something. It doesn't weigh nothing. And if it weighs nothing, then it's probably just air. But to have a negative mass, how can something weigh less than nothing? So this was a really big problem in their theory because what they were finding was when they burned material, say they had a fire or they burnt some substances, when they looked at the calcs, when they looked at the material that was left over after it had been burned, the material actually weighed more than it did before it had been burnt. Now that made no sense with phlogiston theory because if a, the phlogiston was getting released into the air, if you're losing something, then how can it possibly be heavier than before you burned it? And it's quite easily explained when you think that oxygen is actually combining with the materials. So you're actually gaining oxygen molecules, which actually increases the, the weight and the mass of the object. But if you don't know what oxygen is and you're looking at phlogiston as a theory, then it's really hard to explain how something can gain weight after you burn it. So this theory again, let's just remind ourselves the phlogiston was getting released into the air. The air would become saturated, too heavy with it, and then the substance would stop burning because it cannot absorb any, the air around the substance can't absorb any more phlogiston. So, enter Antoine Lavoisier. Antoine Lavoisier was a French chemist and he was active in the late 1700s and he's hailed as the father of modern chemistry. So he's really the link or the bridge between alchemy and modern chemistry. Using hermetically, don't worry about that, sealed vessels and improved balances, so ways of measuring weight, he was able to observe two things that really threw a wrench into the phlogiston theory. First of all, when metals are burned, the mass of the metal plus the calx, so what was left over, was actually more than the metal itself. So like I said earlier, it weighed more than it did before he burned it. Secondly, when metals are burned in a sealed vessel, the mass of the vessel plus all of its contents remain unchanged. So that's really important. He's talking about a sealed vessel, so a, a sealed beaker. Say I burned something, you can see the image here. What he would do is he would have a substance in this area of the flask. He would burn the substance, the air or the chemicals that were released, would be trapped in another beaker over here but effectively he could measure the whole thing still okay he wasn't losing any of the chemicals going out into the atmosphere he was keeping it all contained and what he showed here was 
when metals are burned in a sealed vessel, so here, this is the this sealed vessel, the mass of the vessel plus all of the contents remained unchanged. So even after the chemical reaction, even after everything had been burned, there was no change in weight. Now that was really important because these two, ob two observations require that the phlogiston has a negative mass. So the mass of the metal calx increases when the phlogiston leaves. And as far as we know, nothing has a negative mass. So he'd stumbled upon, really, phlogiston couldn't really happen. It couldn't be the right theory. Something else was going on. Also, there was a problem with charcoal. It was well known that a metal calx, when exposed to charcoal at high, high temperatures, would revivify and reform the surface of the original metal. According to the phlogiston theory, phlogiston had to be transferred from the charcoal to the metal. So far, so good, since the metal weighs less than the metal plus its calx. It makes sense that it has absorbed the negative mass phlogiston. However, Lavoisier performed an experiment in which he burned charcoal in a closed container all by itself. The charcoal burns completely and the mass of the container is left unchanged. So he managed to burn the charcoal until there was nothing left, but there was still weight in the sealed vessel. When Lavoisier measured the density of the air inside the container, he found that it had increased after the charcoal was burned. Some material with a positive mass had united in the air to increase its density. How is that possible if phlogiston, which was known to be present in great quantities in charcoal, had a negative mass? So how could this be giving weight somewhere else? So let me explain that because that's quite wordy. If you burned all the charcoal, which was supposed to be full of phlogiston, and phlogiston was supposed to weigh less than zero, how then, when you burn all of the charcoal, would the weight be transferred in the air to another part of the vessel? That wouldn't make sense if the phlogiston had a negative mass. Therefore, something else was going on. So, Lavoisier showed numerous other inconsistencies in phlogiston theory that centre around the question of mass. Essentially, no formulation of phlogiston theory could justify a phlogiston that had, was sometimes massless, sometimes had a positive mass, and sometimes had a negative mass. Instead, Lavoisier posited the existence of oxygen. A positive mass substance that exists in air is depleted by combustion reactions. So whenever we set fire to things in oxygen, it's called a combustion reaction. It can combine with metals to form calx, known as metal oxides, and it can react with charcoal to make fixed air, or what we call carbon dioxide. So oxygen works in many ways as phlogiston's opposite. So all of the problems with phlogiston theory could be explained if we have this new substance called oxygen that exists in air doing everything that we expect it to do. Combining, giving weight, causing combustion. When it runs out, that's why the fire dies. So using the oxygen theory of combustion, suddenly everything made sense. In 1779, Lavoisier coined the name oxygen for the element released by mercury oxide. He found oxygen made up 20% of air and was vital for combustion and respiration. So we're going to talk about respiration later on. He also concluded that when phosphorus or sulfur are burned in air, the products are formed by the reaction of these elements with oxygen. The name oxygen comes from the Greek word oxygenes, meaning acid producer. It was called this because early chemists thought that oxygen was necessary for all acids to form. So oxygenes in Greek is acid producer. So everything you're breathing in just now is acid producer, oxygen. Wow, okay. Apologise, there was a lot of talking there. Hopefully you've got through some of your questions, but we needed to just explain. I think it was important to give us a little bit of context about the theories that we have now and how the conservation of mass really helped us understand how things can catch fire and continue to burn in the presence of oxygen. Hamish has gave us this interest month. Some fungi create zombies, then control their minds. One thing I want you to look at is cordyceps. Cordyceps on YouTube is crazy. Um, it's a fungus that can infect insects and take over their minds. So if you want to have a look on YouTube for something like that, knock yourself out. Super interesting. Thank you guys.